and a great innovator needs no introduction, not only in India, but worldwide. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Good morning, dear friends. And uh, today I'll be speaking about the iStent technology, which has been recently introduced and uh, also our initial results with this device. I am a consultant to Carl Zeiss Meditech and Biotech. So if you look at the world population and glaucoma, uh, why should we intervene earlier in cases of glaucoma? So between 2020 sir, and 2026. Uh, just, a, just a moment, I think they are not. Uh, oh, sorry, my slides are not up. Okay. Excuse me. AV person. It's showing here, but it's not. So why should we intervene earlier in uh, glaucoma? Because t between 2020 and 26, the population of the 60 plus years will grow worldwide. In 2021, 13.8% of the population are over 60 years. In 2050, 19% will be over 60 years. And this is the age group which is susceptible for glaucoma. So if you look at the Indian perspective, there are about 16 million um, cases of glaucoma and 63% of uh, them are on medication. That's 1.65 million patients on glaucoma. 90% of these cases are undiagnosed. And uh, even if these patients are put on medication, the adherence to using the medication is only 53% post six months. So the direct cost of treating glaucoma increases as the disease progresses. That means you will have to put the patient on more number of drops. 84% of the economic cost of treating glaucoma lie outside the health and social care system. This is the data from UK. And if you look at the cost of the devices, you may think that it is expensive, but if you look at the cost of the devices, it's actually relatively small compared to the cost of the medications being used. And apart from the cost of the medication being used, there's also a cost of informal care, quality of life costs, and productivity costs, which increases much more. So actually using these devices to treat glaucoma um, early is more beneficial for the patient. If you look at the treatment options today in India, you have medications, you know, you all know the various medications from prostaglandins uh, to uh, basic medications like pilocarpine. You also have laser trabeculoplasty. Then for advanced cases, you have filtering surgeries like uh, trabeculectomy and uh, ocular implants. But if you look at the patients on medication, like I said, only 53% adherence to medications uh, post six months. So now there is a new entity, which is microinvasive surgery being introduced, which is the trabecular micro bypass surgery, which lowers IOP by increasing the trabecular and the uveous scleral outflow. And this is making a paradigm shift for in treatment of mild to moderate glaucoma. So if you look at the device itself, the eye stent inject, it has got two devices in an injector. And if you look at the anatomy of the device, it's got a rare flange, which is basically retained in the anterior chamber. In the center of the flange, there is a central uh, inlet. You can't see it here. The central inlet is 80 microns in diameter. Then it's got a neck, which basically sits in the uh, trabecular meshwork and then it has got this nozzle here with four side outlets which are 50 microns in diameter and a central outlet which is 80 microns so it's like a hollow tube of 80 microns and then 50 microns outlet so the eye stent is designed to enhance visibility it to facilitate seamless placement in the trabecular meshwork and provide observable positioning confirmation and uh, deliver consistency and predictability of the procedure. So this is the animation of the procedure. You go in there and then inject the eye stent, and this is a successful implantation. Then you move two clock away, hours away, and implant the second device. 
there is a button which you can press which shoots the device and implants the device and then you retract the injector. So iStent is uh, designed to deliver an optimized access to the multiple collector channels along outer wall of the Schlems canal without relying on extreme dilatation or scaffolding. And the arc of flow can span at least five to six clock hours. And it can also reestablish flow in previously dormant outflow channels. So there are some interesting studies. There was an aqueous angiography study conducted by Alex Fan, And you can see the uh, aqueous angiography before the eye stent is implanted. And you can see just there's one collector channel there. But then after implantation, you can see how the collector channels You can see how the collector channels open up and then improve the drainage in this area. So there's also another uh, interesting study of the uh, ASOCT by Gilman. And he performed five AAC OCCP scan uh, in each eye, one section directly above each eye stent uh, inject and uh, one section 500 microns away from the eye strength inject and one uh, on the temporal limbus. And then what he found that uh, 12 months post-op, the major diameter of the Schlems canal had significantly increased in operated versus unoperated eye. There was a 70%, 75% increase next to the eye strength inject and 46% uh, increase in the opposite limbus. So the increased aqueous flow resulted in a significant circumferential diameter of the Schlems canal while maintaining the integrity and physiological functions of the trabecular meshwork. So it's like a, a, a flexible pipe, which is 360 degrees, the Schlems canal. And then once the pressure in one area increases, this transmits to 360 degree and there's a dilatation of the whole Schlems canal and improved outflow. The other important aspect of the eye stent is the tissue preservation. And uh, we know that the trabecular meshwork has several important physiological functions. It's shown to function as a mechanical pump. And you can see the um, video there, which shows the movement there. And it actively shunts the aqueous humor into the Schlems canal. And of course, the meshwork cells are actively phagocytic and may pr play a role in controlling IOP. And if you remove the trabecular meshwork, like in procedures like goniotomy or et cetera, you can remove the blood aqueous barrier and it can contribute to the pathophysiology of inflammatory ocular disease. So what are we targeting in mild to moderate patients? In mild glaucoma, the initial IOP range could be kept at 15 to 17 millimeters of mercury. That is the target IOP. In moderate glaucoma, a target IOP would be 12 to 15 millimeter. In severe glaucomatous damage, ideally it should be in single digits. So IOP of 14 to 18 is a drop of 25 to 30% and uh, less number of drops may be required, better compliance, and it can halt the progression of glaucoma. There was a study uh, by Richard Lindstrom uh, over four years on uh, using the eye stent as a standalone. That means not combined with cataract surgery and on patients with one uh, medication. And uh, if, if you look at the outcomes, there was a drop in uh, the pre-op IOP of around 24.4 to around 13.2 uh, um, over 48 months. And 95% um, with IOP less than uh, 18 millimeters and 82% with IOP less than 15 millimeters. And only one eye underwent uh, secondary glaucoma surgery. So 46%. IOP reduction and 95% of these patients were medication free. If you look at the meta-analysis uh, studies using eye strain device in standalone procedures, uh, 13 studies and 778 eyes and a follow-up between six months and five years, you can find that the uh, IOP dropped for, from over 25 millimeters of mercury to about 15 millimeters of mercury. And even the prospective case series also showed a similar drop in the IOP. So regarding the disease stability, there is 20 years of data um, 
20,000 I studied in 20 plus countries, uh, 16 studies with four to eight years follow up and 40 plus studies demonstrating the protective effect of the eye stent against progressive visual field loss. So if you look at the disease stability in standalone cases, this is the visual field uh, mean defect. You can see there's any, hardly any progression over five years. Even in cases combined with uh, cataract, it is very similar, 6.6 .6 to 6.7. And uh, if you look at the RNFL uh, damage, again, there is hardly any progression, 82.1 versus 80.9 in standalone and 81.4 to 80.2. And the CD ratio also remained fairly stable, both in standalone and the uh, combined procedures. So there was also, a, if you look at the quality of life outcomes, there is uh, improvement in the ocular surface because you are going to reduce the drops being used or eliminate drops being used. And the mean OSI score reduced from 40.1 to 17.5. And even the TBUT also improved and uh, the corneal and conjunctival st uh, staining and hyperemia reduced. So which are these patients who are suitable for the eye stent inject? Mild to moderate open angle glaucoma, uh, pseudo exfoliation of pigmentary glaucoma, CD ratio less than 0.8, pre of IOP of up to 30 millimeters, and uh, target IOP of uh, 15 millimeters where you want to achieve about 15 millimeters of mercury. Phakic or pseudo uh, patients, patients who have difficulty taking medications, patients with side effect to medications, patients with poor compliance, patients who would benefit from a reduction in IOP or reduction in medication. They should have a normal angle anatomy uh, determined by gonioscopy and absence of peripheral anthracinity. So coming to the global experience of the eye strength inject, is uh, 15 plus years um, and then over 1 million uh, eye strengths uh, implanted, 250 plus articles which are published. And this is one case which I have done combined with uh, cataract. So first I do a temporal uh, clear corneal incision of 2.2 uh, millimeters. That's the capsular excess being performed and the hydro. You can see that this is almost like a three plus to four uh, nucleus sclerosis. And this patient had both uh, dense cataract and also uncontrolled glaucoma on three medications. And uh, this is the FACO and that's the last fragment being removed. IA is performed for complete cortical cleanup. And then uh, this is a single piece uh, IUL being injected into the capsular bag. And uh, once you do that, then uh, you put in the viscoelastic and place the gonio prism there. Use a heavy uh, cohesive viscoelastic to maintain the chamber. And that is the eye strength inject. You go and then you extend the trocar. You can see the blood in the Schlems canal and the trabecula vesper. You gentle, you put gentle pressure and then press the button so that the eye stent is delivered into the trabecula meshwork and you can see the implantation and you can see the ooze from the Schlems canal. So if you get blood oozing, it shows that you are in the Schlems canal. You move about two to three clock hours away and then again you depress with the trocar, the trabecular meshwork, indent it, and then inject the second eye stent. And again, you can see some amount of ooze. And that is the injector. And there you have the two eye stents. And you can put in viscoelastic, sometimes just to clear the blood to see if the uh, eye stent is uh, in place. And uh, that's the end of the procedure. So coming to our initial results, I'll just take one more minute. Uh, results of 18 uh, implants, uh, patients with mild to moderate uh, open angle glaucoma. We excluded primary open angle glaucoma, advanced glaucoma, and secondary glaucomas. So the mean age was uh, 17 uh, years and more males than females. Uh, 16 um, eyes underwent a combined eye stent and a cataract, and two were standalone. And we had a five month follow up. This is a five month uh, in, uh, outcomes. 78% had complete success, and we were able to stop all medications. Um, so that is uh, 14 out of 18 eyes and pre-op with uh, AGM, most of them on three drops was uh, pressure was 15.28 and post-op without AGM, it was 12.5 millimeters, the mean pressure. And we had 11% qualified success. That is two out of 18. Pre-op IOP was 25 millimeters. Post-op IOP was 23.5 uh, millimeters. 
and there were two failure cases, pre-op IOP without AGM was 28, post-op IOP with uh, AGM was 19 millimeters. B this is probably because the stents were not properly placed. And the IOP drop on an average was 14.67. The AGM reduction was 66.7% on an average in these cases. And 77.8% of patients were drop free. So the eye stent can be conducted with the cataract surgery. It's an elegant procedure with excellent safety profile, reduces IOP and allows uh, drop reduction, improves compliance and quality of life, beneficial for mild to moderate patients, and it shows disease stability in over five years period. Thank you very much for your attention. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Thank you, sir, for that uh, elaborate talk. Just a question about the learning curve. How difficult it is for a cataract surgeon to be... Uh, you know, Actually, for a FACO surgeon, the learning curve is not very difficult. What you need to do is visualize the angle structures, learn how to use the gonio prism. You will have to turn the patient's head and tilt the microscope at about 35 degrees, angle 35 to 40 degrees, so you are able to clearly visualize, and you have to use high magnification. Regarding the eye stent uh, inject itself using the eye stent, it is very important that you should not bend the trocar. So you should visualize. So what I do is medium magnification, I put in the uh, trocar cannula, then I'm able to see the trabecular meshwork. Once I go close to the trabecular meshwork, then I increase the mag. And then I just gently indent. If you indent too much, you will have an over implantation. And then it gets buried in the trabecular meshwork and passes the Schlems canal, and then it does not work. So the mild indentation, and then you inject it and then move to trocar hours and very important is that you should not move the trocar because trocar is very thin if it bends then again it will not deliver the eye stent properly and when you move it horizontally you can see it but when you move it vertically in the microscope it's difficult to see so you should be very aware not to move that so if you take these precautions and use a proper viscoelastic and see that it is implanted in the correct place uh, that is important when you start off you can uh, block the patients because sometimes some patients are not cooperative, they are moving. And in patients with, uh, many of these patients are high myopes. So when you have high myopia with glaucoma, then the eye is very compliant. And that's when the viscoelastic leaks out and the cornea gets distorted because you, it's compliant and your visibility reduces. So in such cases, you have to be careful not to depress on the wound and to use a uh, coercive viscoelastic and then maintain the chamber and so that the visibility is good. Sorry, I just had a question. On what basis did you decide that the disease was mild to moderate? Depending upon the visual fields, the CD ratio and the RFNL. Okay, yeah, that is a very important consideration that the disease has to be decided mild to moderate based on visual fails. And I wanted to add to what uh, he was asking, you know, gonioscopy per se, whether in the outpatients, definitely in the outpatients is a very poorly, um, you know, uh, the uptake for it is very poor. So any cataract surgeon who wants to take up, or any ophthalmologist or any glaucoma specialist who wants to take it up, they need to do, they need to get used to, to uh, do a a gonioscopy in outpatients first, be very clear about these structures and only then uh, you know, yeah. practice intraoperative gonioscopy, which is completely different, and then only Because proceed. in India, you have a higher incidence of uh, narrow-angle glaucoma, and these are cases which don't do well. So you will have to do a gonioscopy in the outpatient and then rule out, see that the angle is open, the anatomy of the angle is kind of normal, there are no peripheral anterior sinicae before you post these cases. But That's very they, important. And you can do a dry lab. See, if you ask the company people, they will help you with that. You do a dry lab where you can actually visualize and then implant. And what you can do is, on your routine cataract patients, once you finish the cataract surgery, you can use the gonio prism and then uh, start visualizing the uh, angle and then look at the trabecular meshwork and see that you're comfortable doing that for a few cases before you actually try to implant the eye stand. You wanted to ask something? Quick question, then I'll ask Dr. Narin Chetty. See, if you implant it properly, it, because of the neck, which is that the anatomy of the implant is such that it goes and then there's a nozzle and a neck, it gets stuck in the trabecular meshwork. 
and you can visualize it. What I do is I put a little bit of viscoelastic. Sometimes there's blood, I clear it, and sometimes I just touch the implant to see whether it is stable. So far we have not had, but you can have a implant. It is possible that it can get expelled. If it gets expelled, then it may move, it may touch the endothelium. So again, post-op, doing a gonioscopy post-op is very important, and you see that it's in place. So sometimes you can get a double implantation also. That, that means if you're very forceful, if you indent too much and press, you can have a first implant and a second implant. So you have two implants in the same place. And then you find that the, when you move two clock away, uh, hours away and you want to implant, there is no implant. So you have to be careful of double implantation, over implantation. And also uh, one you. of a small tip on uh, visualizing, like Ma'am was saying, sometimes it can become pretty challenging intraoperatively to visualize the structure. A small tip in this kind of case is first you tilt the eye to the, I mean, tilt, tilt the, head, the head, head and then nasally, and also you can angulate your microscope, you know, in such Some a way that the, uh, the angulation of the microscope is like this, and the head is also tilted nasally. 35 and then to 40 degrees angulation. Makes it much more Many easier, of them yeah. have automated angulation, like the RTO, and even the new Luxor, yeah. which is coming from Alcon, they are bringing, it, uh, bringing out an automatized, yes. motorized, so you can have a motorized tilt. So you can set it to whatever, 35, 40 degrees, and then you press the foot pedal and the... Well, there is already a lens available where you don't need to tilt either the patient or the microscope or anything. You can do it uh, coaxial. In so, a you know, it's a, it's a growing market. Yeah. In a standalone case of glaucoma, where we are not combining it with uh, cataract, which is the ideal position to place it and from where should we enter? You first make a side port with a MVR and let the trocar yeah. enter? Temporal. See, basically you make the incision temporal and you do a nasal implantation. That is best for visualization. Yes. You Thank you. Sir. I think uh, and I would like to 